Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Paul Douglas and Linda Darnell in Letter to Three Wives. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. As a motion picture director, I know the first requirement of a good picture is a good story. So when Letter to Three Wives received the Screenwriters Guild Award for the Best Written Comedy of 1949, it was obvious that Joseph Mankiewicz had turned out an unusually clever screenplay for the 20th Century Fox hit. It concerns a letter written by a small-town siren to three wives and how that letter threatens their security and happiness. Tonight, we have Linda Darnell in her original role, and co-starring with her, also from the original cast, is Paul Douglas, who achieved enormous success on Broadway before he brought his refreshingly different talent to the screen. We know you're welcome, Letter to Three Wives, just as we have welcomed letters from thousands of wives about Lux Flakes. We're very grateful for these letters because they tell us exactly why you like our product. And with Lux Flakes, that isn't hard, is it? The curtain rises on Saul Siegel's production, Letter to Three Wives, starring Paul Douglas as Porter and Linda Darnell as LeMay. I've just finished writing the letter. In a moment, the messenger boy will take it down to the dock. He'll deliver it to my three dearest friends, Deborah and Ruth, and on the excursion boat. And tonight, after the excursion, they'll all be together again. The first dinner dance of the season at the country club. I'm Mrs. Ross, Addie Ross. But this isn't my story, not exactly. It's the story of my three dearest friends. Let's start with Deborah, shall we? Mrs. Brad Bishop. I've known Brad a long, long time. It was Brad who gave me my first black eye and, uh, and my first kiss. When Brad came home from the war, he brought a wife with him, Deborah. I wonder, I wonder what they were talking about at breakfast this morning. Brad, is that your bag out in the hall? You going somewhere? Just to the office. But why the suitcase? Oh, because I know these Saturday conferences, they go on and on and on. Well, you didn't tell me you planned to be away overnight. Well, I'm not planning anything of the kind. The bag is just in case. What are you going to wear to the dance? I bought the dress in vogue you like so much. Brad, I don't want to go to the country club, not without you. What are you so afraid of? Oh, it... It's the thought of going without you... Brad, Addie Ross... Well, what about Addie Ross? She used to be sort of your ideal, wasn't she? What's my not being there got to do with Addie Ross? I never knew you read Vogue, Brad. I never thought men bothered much about it. But I told you I picked the magazine up on the train. In it, I happened to see a, a dress that I thought would look very smart on you. What's wrong with that? Well, I... I'd better be on my way. I have to pick up Rita. You'll phone about tonight, won't you? Yes, of course. Brad, it just happens that that dress you picked out of Vogue is exactly the dress that Addie wore on... Oh, Deborah won't stay mad at him long. She's too much in love with Brad. Women, so silly. Right now, she's in front of Rita's house. Rita and George Phipps. Morning, George. Where's Rita? Oh, she's coming. On behalf of the underprivileged children of this town, I'd like to thank you overprivileged ladies for sharing your excess privileges with us. George, there's something different about you today. Something odd-looking. Oh, just that usual two-headed school teacher look. But there's no school on Saturday and you're all dressed up. This? Oh, just my little old blue serge. First Saturday of the trout season, too. 
Brad says you just never make... so happens I have something better to do. Debbie, darling, we'll just have to stop by at the station. I've just got to get my script off on the 842. Do you mind? We'd better hurry, Rita. Bye, George. Bye, Debbie. What's George being so mysterious about? I wouldn't know. It seems we're not talking. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's just one of those things. Was he acting strangely? Oh, only well, he's not going fishing and all dressed up. Well, so he is. His blue suit. And on Saturday, of all things. Oh, do you mind if I turn on the radio? It still isn't working. It's just as well. Save myself listening to the murder of my little brainchild. Rita, why on earth do you do it? Five radio programs a week, up until dawn, almost every night writing them. Why? Because each week in return, I receive 200 pieces of what Addie Ross calls the most restful shade of green in the world. Addie again. Why is it that sooner or later we always wind up talking about Addie Ross? I wonder if she knows how much we do talk about her. And what we say. And how we feel about her. Well, now you've met Deborah and Rita. What about Laura May? Laura May's already at the dock. She's been waiting for her friends to arrive. Sorry, we're late, Laura May. Rita had to show anyone there you know. Just a husband of hers running like mad to catch the train. Well, where's Addie? Isn't she here yet? Addie Ross left town this morning. Left town? What are you talking about? She's left for good. But but why? What happened? It must have been very sudden. Laura May, for heaven's sake, tell us. Well, the doorman told me she subleased her apartment last week, and yesterday she sold her car. So much for your sudden decision. Well, if that isn't just like Addie. But, but why such a big secret? Oh, who knows why Addie does or doesn't do anything. Let's get on oh, the boat. Wait a minute. Yes, young man. I got a message for the Mez Dames Bishop, Hollingsway, and Phipps. Ha! From the dear departed, I'll bet. Addie's so tactful. She even puts us in alphabetical order. <laughs> Open it up, Rita. No. No, let's wait. For what? Till we're back from the boat trip. Knowing Addie... <laughs> I mean, why let her spoil our day? It's going to be tough enough taking care of 50 children. She won't spoil my day. Addie Ross never saw the day she could spoil my day. All right. Read it, then. Dearest Debbie, Laura May, and Rita, as you know by now, you'll have to carry on without me from here. It isn't easy to leave town, to tear myself away from you three dear, dear friends who have meant so much to me, and so I consider myself extremely lucky to be able to take with me a sort of memento, something to remind me always of my three dearest friends whom I want never to forget. You see, girls... I've run off with one of your husbands, Love Addie. Well, if that's her idea of a joke... Who does she thinks she's kidding? If I ever catch up with that character, Ladies, I'll tell her... may I suggest, uh, the captain seems to think, well, now he's getting rude about it. Who's getting rude? But either they get aboard this tub or we go without him. Well, it looks like Addie has crowned one of us, Queen of the May. Come on, girls, let's take a boat ride. Nothing to do now except entertain the kids and have a nice, relaxing boat trip. Girls, what are you looking so serious about? But it couldn't be your husband, Deborah, or yours, Laura And certainly not yours, Rita. Oh, but it must be one of them, mustn't it? And you won't know, poor things, not for hours and hours. What are you doing, Deborah? Reading the kids a story? Oh, but I know what you're thinking about. You're thinking about the time you married Brad, and how he brought you to our town, and how you met us all that night at the country club dance. Looks like we're the only ones left at the table. Yes. Yes, it does. Well, suits me. Have some more wine, Deborah? I shouldn't, but I'm going to. Who says you shouldn't, Brad? No. I say I shouldn't. Now, let's see... You're Porter. Porter Hollingsway. I do that, too, when I'm drunk. Try to remember names. And Laura May, she's your wife. You have to excuse me, Porter. I'm trying to get everyone straight. Brad's friends. I'm behaving like a fool. Don't you feel good? My dress, just look at it. It's all I have. I didn't know we were coming here tonight. My first night in town. Oh, I could die. I feel that way, too, when I'm drunk. 
You want to dance? I wanted Brad to be proud of me. Me, I'm not much at dancing. Makes me nervous. Why didn't I stay home? Can't do a thing well, leave it alone, I always say. Especially the rumba. Gotta have Spanish blood or something, like Laura May. My wife comes from an old Spanish family named Finney. In many South American countries, there are many very distinguished families with Irish names. Laura May looks good dancing with... She looks good, not her. He's got class. Was she dancing with a tramp, she'd look like a tramp. Got no class of her own. I like class. You like class? Oh, very much. You hit the jackpot, Brad Bishop. Class plus money. Count them on the fingers of one hand in this town. Throw away some fingers, even. Let's see now. There's Brad and... and, uh, And who else? Yeah, there's Addie. Addie? Addie who? Addie Ross. Funny, people always figured that someday Brad and Addie would sort of... Brad and Addie Uh, what? Give up. Samba can be danced properly only on the side of a hill, on ice. Alibi. George is afraid of getting wrinkles in his new suit. Sit down. My first new party dress in years, Porter, thanks to my dear wife and her millions of loyal listeners. Shall we drink to them all, one by one? Uh, Deborah, how about some coffee, dear? Black coffee. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much. I think your new tuxedo has class, George. Class. We thank you. Funny thing for a wife to give her husband a tuxedo. An even funnier thing for a husband to give his wife. (laughs) You're so funny, George. I still don't think a woman ought to buy clothes for a man. It's contrary to nature. Tell us about nature, Porter. Well, it's a man's world. See something you want? Go get it. That's nature. That's why we were made strong women weak. Strong conquer, provide for the weak. That's what a man's for. Teach our kids more of that, be more men. But those standards don't apply to me, Porter. In this man's world, I'm not a man, I'm a school teacher. I knew we'd get around to that. All right, school teachers ought to be paid more. What happens if they're not? How does a school teacher provide people? How does he pay the rent for the plays and the poems of Shakespeare? Has Porter been shooting off his big mouth again, George? You just shut up, Laura Maid. It's time to dance again. You never know what he'll come up with when he starts knocking on that brandy bottle. You shut up. You just shut up. <laughs> oh, I told you this would be fun, Deborah. We're all pals. But just be happy for you. Champagne, Mr. Bishop. Shall I serve it, sir? Well, this is an occasion. With the compliments of Mrs. Addy Ross, sir. Addy Ross? Boy, you were saying something before about Brad and her. Uh, where is Mrs. Ross, waiter? I don't believe she has arrived yet, sir. Oh. That's Addie for you. Always the right thing at the right time. And who... Who is Mr. Ross? Mr. Ross took a powder about five years ago. No such thing. She gave him the heave-ho. He went out for a paper one night and never came back. (laughs) Porter was... Porter was saying that Addie Ross has class. And he knows class like I know navigation. Actually, what Addie has is taste. I can buy taste. Addie's got class. Taste and discrimination. Women usually get them out of magazines, but they're part of Addie's natural equipment. Also, fog lights, white side walls, and a heater. Isn't it fun, Deborah? When the boys all agree on Addie Ross and George Washington, nobody else. They're playing a waltz, Deborah. Come on, let's show them a flash of old Vienna. Brad, please, if you don't mind... Before the floor gets crowded... You're sure you want me to dance? Of course I'm sure. You know, something tells me this is going to be quite a waltz. I arrived at the dance just as Deborah tripped over the seam of her dress and went sprawling. Or maybe it was that last glass of wine that tripped her. Anyway, it made quite a scene. Ruined my entrance completely. Deborah, <laughs> darling, what on earth's the matter well, with you? Come on, Brad. Come on, honey. You just come with me. I can't stay in the powder room all night. Please take me home, Rita. Take me now, home. Now, look. You've got the idea that everybody's just waiting for you to come out. Maybe not, but Brad is. Because he's worried about He's this. ashamed of me. And I wanted so much to be walked do what I... Like, like Addie Ross... The right thing at the right time. But all I did was, was humiliate him. What happened tonight could have happened to anyone. Now, just take my word for it and come on. There's Brad, out there on the terrace with someone. I told you he was worried. Oh, I see that Addie finally got here, too.
That was a long time ago, wasn't it, Deborah? That's when you first heard about me. And a little seed of suspicion took root. That's why you dread ever going home today. My letter. You're so sure it is bad, aren't you? Who knows? Maybe you're right, darling. Maybe it is. <laughs> In a moment, our stars will return with Act Two of Letter to Three Wives. Here's our producer, Mr. Keeley. Act Two of Letter to Three Wives, starring Linda Darnell as Laura May and Paul Douglas as Porter. There's an excursion boat on the Hudson River. Aboard are three young, attractive wives who a couple of hours ago received a carefully timed letter from their dear friend, Addie Ross. Addie has told them that she's run away with one of their husbands, and no one knows better than each of the wives how easily he might be her own. What's the matter, Debbie? The kids are off. Oh, I just took a minute to, to enjoy the view. Well, I think I've got the answer. Laura May. She's kept herself as busy as a bird dog ever since we got on this boat. If you're busy, you don't have time to think, do you? Depends what you think about. For instance, why your husband should suddenly decide to go to New York on a Saturday morning? Because Brad said... Brad? I'm talking about her husband. I saw Porter at the station when I mailed my script. He nearly knocked me down. Why should you think I meant Brad? Maybe because it might keep you from wondering why your husband dressed up on a Saturday with no school. You're being a little too touchy about a perfectly innocent remark, it seems to me. Oh, let's stop this sudden bickering. We'll be beginning to behave like some movie about a women's prison. Not a bad comparison at that. Oh, leave it to Eddie, breaking the news to us like this. Knowing we couldn't do a thing about it all day long. Well, dear, enjoy the view. Daddy's gone off with Porter, that's who. Maybe Brad, but I don't think so. It's Porter. Only... Only why didn't George go fishing today? And his blue suit. Why his blue suit? Yes, Rita. Why? Oh, but I don't have to tell you. You know you're to blame, don't you? You know how George feels about teaching school. You also know how he feels about your trying to earn money writing those radio scripts. Do you remember, Rita, the time you insisted upon having those radio people come to dinner? Mr. and Mrs. Manley. Remember, dear? Now, listen to me, Sadie. They're very important people, so let's get a couple of things straight. First, when you announce dinner... I know, I know. I ain't supposed to say soup's on. Okay, dinner is served. All the ancient people from the city are going to eat here. They happen to be in charge of a great many radio programs, including the one I write. You know what I like about your program? Even when I'm running the vacuum, I can understand it. <laughs> Thank you so much. You brought a uniform, I hope. Eh, it's kind of corny, but I'll wear it if I gotta. Well, I'm back. Oh, did you get the liquor and cigarettes? Right here. Well, where's the scotch, George? I didn't buy any. Too expensive. But the Manleys are sure to want scotch. People in show business... Well, you know what I mean. Those kind always drink scotch. I know what you mean, dear, but I wish you wouldn't say it in radio English. That kind, not those kind. There are men who say those kind who earn $100,000 a year. There are men who say stick them up who earn even more. <laughs> I don't expect to do either. Nor are you expected to pay for the scotch. You're quite right. It's funny how it slips my mind now and then. <laughs> Oh, don't be silly, darling. Rita, isn't all this a little pretentious? All right, so I'm out to impress the boss. What do I get for that, 30 years? I'm sorry. I'll call up the liquor store and they can send over some scotch, all right? George, just one thing, please. No jokes about radio. Oh, the time for joking about it is past. Radio has become a very serious problem now, like juvenile delinquency. That, that's just what I mean, cracks like that. Oh... Here, this came for you, this package. For me? What is it? I haven't any idea. Oh, wait a minute, there's a card. For George on... on his 
birthday. If music be the fruit of love, play on. Addie. Addie Ross. Rita, look. Beethoven's string quartet. George, your birthday. And I forgot all about it. Well, don't worry about it, darling. I'm not much for birthdays. Oh, but you are. You're very much for birthdays. Well, this time you had a lot on your mind. Even so. George. What a memory Addie's got. Almost a year since we talked about Beethoven. <laughs> Leave it to Addie. When the company came, the Manleys and Porter and Laura May, George was playing the record album I'd sent him. That's what I mean, Mrs. Manley. Sometimes I just don't think we appreciate the miracle of the phonograph. Of uh, what kind of set is that? That radio phonograph? Well, this, Mrs. Manley, is just something one of my students put together for me. Mm, well, if I were you, I'd stick to the established trademarks. A uh, puritone, say, or or a sonobel. A puritone? Uh, yes, or a sonobel. Well, I thought it sounded all right, Mr. Manley. Didn't you, Porter? My set plays two dozen records, different sizes. Mix them up any way you like. Radio gets China clear as a bell. Also television. Except there's no television to get. We're too far away. <laughs> Only television set in town. Like playing tennis without a ball. What do you want me to do about it? Build your personal television station? You don't need a station. Just yell a little louder. Uh... <laughs> Mrs. Manley, are you sure I can't get you a drink before dinner? A cocktail, perhaps, or a scotch? Never touch alcohol in any form. Mr. Manley? Uh, he uh, doesn't uh, either. Uh, no. <laughs> well, coming from show business, you might say, I always imagine those kind took a nip now and then. How about you, Porter? Yeah. Uh, you know, Mrs. Manley, Mr. Hollingsway here has a chain of seven department stores all over the state. I know all about it. Oh, yours is too big a light to be hid under a bushel, Mr. Hollingsway. George, would you need a small bromo seltzer, please? You're a potential giant, sir. Not too small, George. I'm uh, doing all right. <laughs> I said a potential giant. Yes, potential, yes. Mm. Something tells me I'm going to have a giant around the house. Got this whole state sewed up tight. But there are 47 other states, Port Crack. Jack, Port Jack, with radio, I can put you into millions of those homes for one half hour every week. He doesn't spend that much time in his own home. Soup time. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you, Sadie. Well, if we're all ready, I'll... Sadie think we could... Dugan. Hiya, Laura May. Hey, what's with that outfit you've got on? And get a lot of that cap. What are you supposed to be, baby snooks? <laughs> I can't wait to tell Ma. Ah, there's a couple of things about you I can tell your Ma, too. <laughs> this quaint situation belongs in a true-to-life drama. Are you two related? We just had the same governess. <laughs> you kill me. <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, just a small town, Mrs. Manley. Everybody gets to know everybody. If you don't mind crossing the tracks. Sadie is quite a radio fan, Mrs. Manley. Really? Keep it going night and day. And uh, what are your favorite programs? Anything, so long as it keeps my mind off my feet. Uh, how are you going to put me in her house a half hour every week? But Porter, Sadie's not a housewife. Still, they have a great influence over housewives. Your maid may not realize it, but whether or not she thinks she's listening, she's being penetrated. Well, it's a good thing she didn't hear you say that. And after penetration comes saturation. And when she's saturated, she'll find herself saying, Madam, I suggest that you buy our new washing machine at Hollingsways. Not Sadie. And I've seen her when she was saturated to the eyes. You don't know what they're talking about. Just shut up and eat. <laughs> okay, giant. <laughs> Well, Rita, it was quite an evening. I've never seen you in better form, George. Never. I asked my opinion of their radio programs. I said I'd rather not discuss the subject. They wouldn't let me alone. But it would have been so simple, something noncommittal. Well, certainly she doesn't blame you for what I said. No, I don't too badly about it. And you had to correct her on even that. Bad, Mrs. Manley, not badly. Oh, Georgia, I had told Mrs. Manley so much about you. One of the editors is leaving their agency. There's a job open, $175 a week. And I told her... You told uh, Mrs. Manley I might be interested in working for her? Now, George, please, listen to me. Come here. Come here. Sit down for a minute. Look, Rita, let's put aside my personal likes and dislikes. They're not important. I'm willing to admit that to a majority of my fellow citizens, I'm a slightly comic figure. 
an educated man. Well, nobody's asking you not to be. Think of the good you could do. Maybe raise the standards. And what's even worse than being an intellectual, I'm a school teacher. School teachers are not only comic, they're often cold and hungry in this richest land on earth. And thousands are quitting every year to take jobs that pay them a decent living. That is unhappily true. Then why not you? Because I can't think of myself doing anything else. What would happen, do you think, if we all quit? Who'd teach the kids? Who'd open their minds and hearts to the real glories of the human spirit, past and present? Who'd help them along to the future? Now, at that, I've been luckier than most. Even without what you earn, I've managed to keep our heads above water. It's quite a strain over a period of time with the water lapping at your chin. That's where you've been a great help. I'll admit it has upset my male ego from time to time. And your overdeveloped sense of taste and discrimination, which is apparently equaled only by that of Addie Ross. Let's try to keep Addie out. I am fed up with taste and discrimination. I'm fed up with your contempt for me and everything I try to do. You're talking nonsense. Oh, everything I say is nonsense. It's all this work. You're overtired. You do too much. And what do you suggest I stop doing? My moronic radio scripts, which pay most of your bills? Now, calm down. And what do I go back to? Washing, scrubbing, ironing, and a life of taste and discrimination? I'm fed up with Addie Ross. What's it all about, really? If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it. Sir Nepotin sick, so die. From Twelfth Night by Mr. Shakespeare, which Addie and I played in high school. I thought it was a very clever note. And there was more to it than a childhood memory. Yes, there was. But we won't go into that. Right now, we're going to get a few things straightened out once and for all. Sit down. Yes, Professor. Sit down. Look, Rita, seven years ago, I made the most perfect marriage ever devised by man, heaven, or radio. My wife was an independent, understanding woman. We thought the same thing about everything, from baseball to Beethoven. In those seven years, I was never contemptuous of you. I was proud. But when that drooling pap began to change you, when your independence turned to fear, when I watched you snivel and grovel around those two walking commercials, I didn't like it. And I don't like it. I want my wife back, Rita. I want my wife again. George and Addie. It must be George. Why didn't he go fishing? And his blue suit. Why the blue hey, suit? Hey, Rita. Rita, Debbie wants you. The kids want to play some games. Hmm? Oh, hmm. Incidentally, Laura May, did you know Porter was at the station this morning? Look, honey, why don't I just tell you what you want to know? I don't know whether Porter ran off with Addie or not, but get this, I don't care. Just as good as we are, no matter what you say. Worried? Why? I've got everything I want, but everything. Everything, Laura May? Oh, you come a long way, all right. You didn't live on the other side of the tracks. You lived on the tracks. Remember when you used to work in Porter's store? Remember your first date with him? You had it all worked out pretty carefully, didn't you, Lorne? Well, Ma, how do I look? Oh, hi, you, Sadie. Hi, Laura May. Had a date with the boss, huh? Well, if I was you, I'd show more of what I got. Where maybe something with beads. What I got don't need beads. What's your new job going to be? Something secret, like a spy? Something you can't talk about in the office? All right, sir. I'm going to disgrace the fair name of Fanny. Wait till it snows, Mom. Throw me out in the street. To think that a daughter How of mine... How many payments are you behind on that icebox? Not for all the iceboxes in the world. They can come and take it away. Though heaven knows it's one of the few joys I have in life. Ah, oh, come on, Ruby. Lay off her and deal the cards. Wait till the train goes by and hang on to your teeth. It's an express. They're not going to take away your icebox, and I know exactly what I'm doing. Just remember, you're my daughter and a decent girl. It's him. I guess so. Uh, you got everything? Uh, where's your purse? Right there. Oh, he's out in front. Got a car block long. Well, what are you waiting for? Relax. He just blew his horn again. It ain't Gabriel, so relax. <laughs> Laura May, what are you waiting for? That's what I was waiting for. The doorbell. Anybody wants me can come in and get me. This ain't a drive-in. Well, I never. Oh, 
Good evening, Mr. Hollingsway. Well, good evening. Hiya. Huh? Oh, I see Miss Dugan. I just didn't know my last name was Dugan. <laughs> but I, I don't believe you know my mother, Mrs. Finney. Mother, this is Mr. Hollingsway. <laughs> Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. How do you do? Uh, won't you sit down? Well, I've got a table reserved for half past seven. <laughs> yes, you are late, aren't you? Uh, I won't be a minute. Just get my bag. But your bag's it's right a over. cold night out, ain't it? Well, not bad. The ice box, one of mine, right? Uh-huh. Giant size with a super freeze box, right? Uh-huh. How long you had it? Uh, how long they've been on the market? Oh, a couple of years. That was one of the first. Uh-huh. Oh. I wonder what's keeping her. Mm, girls always got things to do. They tell me. Why, there it is, my purse. Oh, how silly of me. Ready? We're late. Uh, good night, Mother dear. Uh, don't wait up. Good night, Sadie darling. Good night, Sadie, darling. <laughs> Good night, Mother dear, and don't wait up. If a daughter of mine ever really talked like that, I'd cut her tongue out. Beer? If you ain't got any champagne. <laughs> <laughs> My, but this is a nice place, Mr. Hollingsway. I come here all the time. With other young ladies you want to talk to about new duties at the store? Let's not talk business. But I thought that's what this was for, Mr. Hollingsway. We'll get around to it. Uh, what do you do with yourself after working hours, say, uh, night? Well, I have my family and my friends, of course. Boyfriends? Isn't that getting a little personal? A girl like you? I'll bet there's plenty. Who's out in front? I don't happen to be one of those girls that talks about her private life, Mr. Hollingsway, and what I Why do in my... Oh, oh, uh, oh, don't get up. Oh, hello, George. Are you here alone? Well, Rita, Country Jeff, Patty's with us. Patty? That was a last-minute idea. We figured you'd probably have another engagement. Whose idea? Patty's? Uh, may I have a cigarette, please? Huh? Oh, uh, here you are. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh... Phipps, George Phipps. This is Miss Finney. How do you do? Hello, Miss Finney. Been here alone? No, no, we just got here. Hey, stop by the table on your way out. I'd yeah. love to. Oh, you have such nice friends. He's a school teacher, hasn't got a dime. Uh, it's getting stuffy in here. I want some air. Come on, let's drive somewhere. You're smoking. I thought you were out of cigarettes. Didn't you ask George for one back there? Did I? You're smart. Thanks. Plenty smart. Um, Miss Lipke is leaving the store next week. Yeah. And you'll need a new assistant supervisor. Like flies around honey. Huh? You. You and your boyfriend. I thought we'd settle that. I want to talk about it some more. What makes you so interested in my boyfriend? What do you think? I've got... Very definite ideas. Like what? Well, there's never been anybody in particular. Nobody special. Plenty wanted to, I bet. <sighs> what do you think? When you're waiting for that one guy to come along? I've got very definite ideas. What's he got to be like, this one guy? Someone who wants to marry me more than anything else in the world. <sighs> you sure got wrong ideas about things. <laughs> they may be wrong, but they're definite. Well, tomorrow's another working day. Shall we go? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Look, I... I hope you don't mind my bringing it up again, but... But you do remember about Miss Lipke leaving and... What about does... tomorrow night? If you'd like. I'd like. Half past seven. Laura May. You're quite a girl, Laura May. You were right, and I didn't have to worry about you. But now what, Laura May? What was it you told Rita you just don't kill? Me? I wonder. Pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Our 
play Letter to Three Wives will continue in a moment. Here's Mr. Keeley, our producer. The curtain rises on Act Three of Letter to Three Wives with Paul Douglas as Porter and Linda Darnell as Laura May. For Deborah, Rita, and Laura May, they're live. The excursion boat is still far from home. and It'll be hours yet before one of them knows the awful truth, that it's her husband who's run away with Addie Ross. On your next date, you let Porter kiss you, didn't you, Laura May? Just one kiss. But you knew he'd be back tomorrow. He was. And on this date, he just happened to stop by his house. Oh, it's, it's the most beautiful house I've ever seen. It's, well, it's just about everything anybody'd want. You name it, I got it. <laughs> you were married once, weren't you? Is this her picture? My wife? I wouldn't even have her fingerprints in the house. <laughs> then, then who's this? Well, somebody I know. I bet I can guess. Addie Ross. That's right. So that's what she looks like. Well, you can't tell from that, really. It's only a picture. She's beautiful, all right. She sort of looks like a queen, doesn't she? Like a queen ought to look. I imagine you must be very good friends. Well, I helped her with some investments. She gave me this picture last Christmas. Almost a year ago. Yeah, I just never bothered to put it away, I guess. I... Porter. You know how I feel about you. Look, I'm only human, you know. I'm not so sure you are. No? No. Thanks. You're smart. So you told me. I'm smart, too. I've been around. I'll bet. It's an old act. You're good at it, but you can't fool me. I know all the answers. Then answer this one. Why pick on me? I've been watching your work, Miss Finney, and I think you're ready for advancement. Let's have dinner and talk it over. There's a brand new act for you. It's got a beard a mile long. I didn't ask you what. You asked me, and why me? The woods are full of girls. Not like you. You can say it again, not like me. And they don't want what I want. All right, what do you want? Not a $4 a week raise. I don't want a new car, a fur coat, or a trip to Hawaii. Don't want any seven big doors, Mr. Hollingsway. Name it. I want to be in a silver frame on a piano. My own piano in my own house. You mean you want to get married? Does that make me a freak? I've been married once. Once is enough. I'm just not the type. Maybe you just haven't found the right girl. Well, I'm not easy to get along with. I'm set in my ways. I want to do what I want when I want. But if it was just a question of the right girl, wouldn't any man in the world want to marry you? Not if he thought he could marry Addie Ross. Maybe I don't know all the answers, but I know some of them. Well, it's late. I'd better be getting home. Okay, if I call you a cab. Beats walking in the snow. Just tell him to charge it to my account. Sounds like you keep the cabs pretty busy with this sort of thing. I do a lot of business with them. Store business. Well, don't get mad. Well, you just keep needling me. Look, I'd insist on paying for that cab myself, but I'm in no spot to be proud. From tomorrow on, I count for pennies. What's tomorrow? The day I start looking for a new job. I'm not going to fire you. I'm going to quit. Well, what do you want to do that for? That's a silly question, coming from a man who knows all the answers. But don't let it worry you, Porter. Maybe it's just a new twist in the same old act. I'll call the cab. Thanks, I'll pick one up at the corner. Maybe you're right, Porter. Maybe I'm a fool. But maybe you're the biggest fool in the world. Laura May! <laughs> Before you knew it, it was New Year's Eve. Your first New Year's Eve at home in a long, long time. Ma was going to a bingo party, and your sister Babe, naturally, had a date. Where's Sadie tonight, Ma? Isn't she picking you up? Sadie can't go to the bingo party. She's got a job saving up champagne for Mrs. Addie Ross and friends. Guess he'll be there, huh? Porter Hollingsway. Isn't it time you got dressed, Ma? Okay. I'll... It's me. Oh, hiya, Nick. Come on in. Is Babe ready yet? Unless she's beat her brains out with a powder puff. Sit down. Hey, babe. Hey, how come you ain't dressed up? Oh, but I am. I'm going to a fancy dress ball. Yes, what? A queen. A queen? A queen in a silver frame. I don't get it. I'll go see what's keeping babe. I'll see who it is, will you, Nick? 
Yeah? Who are you? Oh, I'm just... Where's Miss Finney? Uh, she'll be out in a minute, Mr. Hollingsway. We met somewhere? I work in your shipping room. You waiting for Miss Finney? Yes, sir. What's your name? Nick Butler. Well, we're just good friends, kind of, me and Miss Finney. Yeah. You better than I worked in your shipping room three years, Mr. Hollingsway. Oh, here they come, babe. And... Boone face, I... Oh, Mr. Hollingsway. This is my sister, babe. My real name is Georgiana. Oh, what do you say, babe? Happy New Year, Mr. Hollingsway. I uh, thought Baboon Face was waiting for you. He used to. I gave him to babe. He goes with a dress. I came to take you to a party. Addie Ross's party? Yeah. She must need another waitress. I told her we had a date and not to expect me if you'd made other plans. Here, these are for you. Orchids, huh? Thanks. Put them on. I'm not going anywhere. You wouldn't want to let them die. I'll put them in the icebox. The orchids ain't paid for either. Laura May, I can't take it anymore. I thought we decided to leave it alone. It's worse not seeing you, knowing you're here. Maybe I ought to leave town. Wondering about you, who you're with, who you're kissing. Take that easy I can't sleep nights thinking about you. So what? What about the way I feel, my sleep? But then I'm not even human, am I? I'm just a great big... Ass. You know, answer. I can't take it anymore. Well, what's the use, Porter? Tell Addie Ross it's the cook's night out and, and I had to stay home with the icebox. Okay, Laura May, you win. I'll marry you. <laughs> How about it? Thanks for nothing. Now, what kind of an answer is that? I don't know it. Just felt like it, that's all. We'll do all right, kid. We're starting out where it takes most marriages years to get. Out in the open, no jokers. You'll see you've made a good deal, Laura May. Laura May, if you want me, honey, I'll be over to the Callahan's Happy place. New Year, Ma. We're going to be married. Bingo! And so they were married. And that's how in time we all became such good friends. Laura May, Deborah, Rita, and I. Oh, that brings us right up to date. The excursion boat has returned now. And the three wives have rushed home. There's a little discovery to be made. Which of their husbands have I run away with? One thing I can tell you, it's not George Phipps. Darling. Oh, darling, darling, uh, George. Well, hello. Oh, George, I've got to know something. I'll just die if I don't know. Tell me this minute, George, and tell me the truth. About what? Why didn't you go fishing today? Uh, Mrs. Manley phoned. She wants you to call her. Some revision she wants you to And you never dress up when there's no school. Why your blue suit? Well, now, there's a little story connected with... Why well, aren't you going to phone her? Revisions, huh? Yeah. Mrs. Manley will get the revisions on Monday. If that doesn't suit her, she can find herself another writer. Rita. I mean it, George. Peace, it's one. Answer my question, the blue suit. <laughs> well, it's just that the high school dramatic club decided to do Twelfth Night, and they asked me to direct it. First rehearsal day, and I boost would be more appropriate than my fishing boots. And, and Addie knew about it. Which accounts for the note she sang. If music be the food of love, play on. And on, and on. Oh, George. Oh, darling. Well, that clears up George, doesn't it? But what's Deborah found out? You know, Brad said he phoned. Oh, yes, madam. Mr. Bishop phoned a little after four. He said he's very sorry, but he won't be home tonight. <laughs> Won't be home. Won't be home. Brad won't be home. Mm-hmm. And now, Laura May. Ma's there with her. Ma's living with him now. Twenty-eight bucks I lost today. Sadie's right. That racetrack's crooked. <laughs> It isn't the track, Ma. It's the horses. They fix things up among themselves. <laughs> Say, uh, how come Porter's so late tonight? It's 7.30. Uh, you know, Ma, Porter may not be coming home at all. You mean tonight? Any night. I, I think he's gone away for good. 
With somebody else? Ah, I don't believe it. I do. Porter would never leave you for good, and not for another woman. Why not? Because he's in love with you. He's what? You hide me plain crazy in love with you. Are you out of your mind, oh, Marty? I thought I heard soft voices in here. <laughs> Hello, Porter. What's the fight about this time? Furs, jewelry, or cash? My children and me never fight. Fix me a drink, will you? I'm tired. And the reason we never fight, me and my children know that I know what I'm talking about. Your father was clear, Sora May, but I learned a lot about men from him. May he rest in peace. Addie Ross left town today, Porter. And she took somebody's husband with her. Yeah? Well, you seem real excited about it, like I told you we were having lamb for dinner. What do you want me to do, sue somebody? I'm tired. I just figured that maybe you were the lucky boy. Then I must have broke your heart when I walked in here. Funny you should mention my heart. So you figured I ran away with Addie. How did it feel? You don't have to tell me. I can tell you. You ought to go on information, please. So what? I got mine. That's what you thought to yourself. You ought to get a concession at some carnival. You're a regular mind reader. Three years of playing the good wife. Here's where I cash in. Here comes the payoff. That's what you thought. I've been a good wife. The best your money could buy. Strictly cash and carry. Isn't that what you wanted? Isn't that what you told me? Out in the open, you made a good deal, kid? Did you ever stop to think, Porter, that in over three years, there's one word we've never said to each other, not even in fun? To you, I'm a cash register. You can't love a cash register. And I'm part of your inventory. You can't love that either. I asked you to marry me because I was crazy about you. You didn't even ask me. Did you give me a chance to? All you ever showed me was your price tag. You better get dressed if we're going to the country club. We're meeting the others there at half past eight. I'll be ready when you are. You know, Porter, this is a lot like my very first dance here. You and I, alone at the table. Yeah, but where's Brad? You don't know? Know what? Let's just say he's been detained, Porter. He didn't come home. You sure you don't want to drink? I'm sure. See that guy dancing with Laura May? A bookie. All the barber shops and saloons in town dancing with my wife. But he came over, he asked very politely. She danced with anybody. Well, she waited to see me. Object of a pansy. <laughs> then you have no right to complain. Oh, no, I got no complaints. I'm Happy Joe from Kokomo. Greatest little wife in the world. Fine home, fine friends. Everybody loves Oh, why me. don't you stop acting like a spoiled baby? What are you sore about? You, you're so stupid. Now, wait a minute, Debbie. Have you any idea how much Laura May's in love with you? No. How much? So much she's afraid to tell you. Afraid you'd laugh at her. Me? Laugh? Why, she couldn't say it with a straight face, Laura May, in love with me. But it's all she can do to wait it out. Wait it out? Yeah, like an annuity till it matures, like a slot machine that pays off. That's what she's waiting for. The chance to call it off, to collect the end of the line. Fares, please. Oh, tell me about love and Laura May. I... Well... Such a fine, relaxed atmosphere. Better take a look under the table, George, see if there's a body hidden. Rita, what was it you called Addie down at the pier? A dear departed? Well, maybe that's who's under the table. Only it's Brad. I don't understand this conversation at all. How drunk am I? Thank you very much for the dance, Mrs. Hollingsway. Let's do it again sometime. And thank you, Mr. Hollingsway. Yeah. Well, he seems pleasant enough. Who is he, Laura May? A business associate of my mother's. He's a bookie. Her mother bets with him. <laughs> Will everyone excuse me, please? I think I'd like to leave. I'll drive you, Dad. I'd rather go by myself, if you don't mind. What's going on here? Shut up. Will somebody tell me what this is all about? Later. I'll tell you later. Don't you really know, Porter? No. Come on, Debbie. Let's take No, a I want to tell Porter what he doesn't know. I want to say it out loud. Deb, don't be silly. I've tried hard to make believe. The way you do, Porter. But I'm not as much of a man as you are. My husband has run away with Addie Rock. Good night, all. Sit down, Debbie. Porter, please. Sit down for a minute. Let her go, Porter. You keep out of it. Everybody else, too. Brad didn't run away with Hattie Ross. Oh. I did. But... But how? You, you're here. A man can change his mind, can't he? Porter, you're quite a guy. Yeah. Porter... <laughs> now let her alone. Let her go if she wants to. She'd have known in the morning anyway that Brad wasn't the one. She'd have had a tough night. She's just a kid. Well, I, uh, uh, dance with me, George. Just a minute, Rita. 
Okay, Laura May, you've got it. They all heard me say I ran away with another woman. You can take me for everything you'll ever want. Like always, Porter, when, when you start knocking on that brandy bottle, you'll come up with anything. I guess I've stopped listening because, because if you said anything, I just didn't hear it. Well, well, why don't everybody dance? You heard her, George. <laughs> Laura May. Oh, you... You big gorilla. But why are you crying? <laughs> Let's dance? Uh-huh. Oh. Good night, everybody. Here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. The curtain falls on three endings for three wives. And here are tonight's stars coming downstage to add a postscript. Linda Darnell and Paul Douglas. I want to congratulate you and the studio that has been nominated for an Academy Award. Well, everyone at 20th Century Fox was very proud, Bill, when Letter to Three Wives and Daryl F. Zanuck's 12 O'Clock High were both among the five pictures nominated. And if there are any awards around for an outstanding comedy team, you and Paul should have them for tonight's performance. <laughs> well, thank you, Bill, but I'll take my Lux Flakes if it's all right with you. Yes, sir, those flakes got class, and that's what I like, class. <laughs> <laughs> that you get some, too, Paul. How are you getting along with art, Linda? Well, I've been working in oil. Everybody's got a well but me. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been doing a little sculpting, too. Uh, Paul, incidentally, uh, sometime I'd like to do a head for you. Look, the one I'm wearing isn't much, but I've had it long. I'm attached to it, you know. <laughs> Paul, I understand you've just completed a new picture on location. Where'd you make it? In New Orleans, Bill. And speaking of pictures, what do you have here next week? A very special attraction with two stars we've had many requests for. First, one of our all-time favorites, Van Johnson. And co-starring the beautiful, glamorous Esther Williams. With them, we'll also have Virginia Gray. And I know you'll love them all in the gay Metro Golden Mayor comedy hit, Easy to Win. Well, that is something special, Bill. Good night. Good night, all. Good, Good night, night and hello back. Here's a beauty tip from a famous screen star, Myrna Loy. She says, for all over Lux loveliness, the new bath size Lux toilet soap is wonderful. You'll agree with Myrna Loy when you try this generous, satin smooth bath size cake. You'll enjoy the rich, creamy lather. You'll love the delicate flower like fragrance a Lux soap beauty bath leaves on the skin. That Lux soap perfume is an exclusive blend of roses, rose, jazz, lilac, to name just a few. A Lux soap beauty bath leaves skin so fresh. Leaves it softer, smoother, too. Next time you shop, get this big, longer-lasting bath-size cake. Remember, nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Van Johnson and Esther Williams in Easy to Wear with Virginia Gregg. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Paul Douglas and Linda Darnell appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of Mother Didn't Tell Me, starring Dorothy McGuire and William Lundigan. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Easy to Wed, starring Van Johnson and Esther Williams with Virginia Gray. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>